Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Sometimes God will lead you into a very uncomfortable place because we don't grow when everything is the way we want it to be. We grow when things are not the way we want it to be and we act like Jesus wants us to act anyway. Paul said, when I went and met with them, I went because of a revelation. <clears throat> Verse 2 of Galatians 2. Though privately I met with those who seemed influential to proclaim among the Gentiles the gospel that I preach in order to make sure I was not running or had not run <clears throat> in vain. Verse 5, I love this. And from those who seemed to be influential... <laughs> What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. In other words, what was Paul saying here? I'm not impressed by your position. I'm not impressed by your title. Can I tell you something? Just because you finagle and connive and manage to get around 10 of the most important people in your church, you know, the in-group, can I tell you that that doesn't really add any value to you? The only value we have is who we are in Christ. And really, a smart Christian, instead of looking for somebody that is important that they think can add value to them, go look for somebody that's lonely and somebody who doesn't seem to have any friends. Pick them out and befriend them, and then guess what? God will promote you. Is any, are you understanding? Amen? You know what? If I said to you, Hey, I want you to come back to the green room. I'm going to have lunch with you today. Do you know what? That would not make you any more important than anybody else that I didn't have lunch with. Because it's not people that give us our importance. It's God that gives us our importance. And every one of you are just as important as anybody else. Your job is not what makes you important. The janitor is just as important as the CEO. Where have I gotten myself off to now? <laughs> And then I love this in verse 8. He says, For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me to the Gentiles. So, Here's the thing, God works through everybody differently, and as soon as you start thinking that you have to do what somebody else is doing, and you deny who you are, you get in trouble. I tried to be so many different people, I got to the point where I didn't even know who I was. I tried to be real sweet like my pastor's wife. I even tried to change my voice, because she was just, she was blonde and blue-eyed and tiny and She had this tiny little sweet voice, and she had this gift of mercy, and people would go to her for counseling, and she'd say, oh, oh, tell me more. I want to hear all about it. Tell me more. Well, I'm thinking, please don't tell me anything else. I know what your problem is two seconds after you walked in here. Now, if you go... <laughs> But I thought, and I actually tried to lower my voice, and people say, what's wrong with you? What? See, you can't, <laughs> pretending to be somebody else, God is never going to help you be somebody else. You might as well be yourself because everybody else is already taken. Oh, Joyce, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Well, I'm glad I can be an example, but please don't be just like me. Go far beyond where I've gone. Let's don't aspire to be somebody else. Let's ask God to help us be the best us that we can be. And that's what Paul was doing. He was being the best that he could be. He said, I'm not impressed by those who seem to be influential. I don't need their approval. I'm going to follow God. 
Is there anybody in this building that has got enough guts to say, I am going to follow God if it means I lose every friend I've got? I mean, is anybody tired of living your life based on what they think? Well, what will they think? Well, what will they say? Well, you know, they say you can't wear those colors together. <laughs> they say that hairstyle's out. They run our life and we don't even know who they are. <laughs> well, I got a few people that are keeping me encouraged up here, so I'll keep going. <laughs> well, I love this. I, I mean, we can see from these scriptures that Paul knew how to wait on God's timing. How many of you know, don't wait very well? <laughs> After Paul spent three years seeking God, then he went and met with Peter for 15 days, and the only other apostle he saw was James, and then he went away for another 14 years. He waited for God's timing in his life. We have to learn how to wait for God's timing. You know, a lot of times when you're called to do something, you sense that call so strongly, but you may not sense the timing. Has anybody here ever gotten out ahead of God? Okay. You know what? It, don't feel too bad about it. We all do it. I tried to go on TV before God put me on TV. And I got one piece of mail in six months. I tried to have a talk show. I'm not a talk show host. I wouldn't let anybody else talk. <laughs> it's the truth. We used to have more guests on our TV programs. They'd bring people in for me to interview. And we were getting complaints. People would write in and say, Joyce, why does not Joyce not let the guests talk? And I'm just not very good at it. I'm good at talking, but I'm not too good at letting other people talk. And so they finally got to the point where I said, you guys are going to have to help me if I'm cutting people off or, you know, not letting them talk. Give me, you know, so they're back there in the background going. <laughs> hey, I'm so far from perfect that it's pathetic. But I love Jesus, and he loves me. And you know what? I think he thinks I'm cute because I won't let anybody else talk. Here's the thing you got to understand. God did not suddenly realize that you are a mess and say, oh, what have I gotten myself into? He knows everything about us, every mistake we're ever going to make, every word that we have not spoken, every thought that we have not yet thought. There's nothing about you that God doesn't know, and he loves you anyway. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees your heart, and if you will not give up on God, God will never give up on you. And he that has begun a good work in you will finish it and bring it to its completion. You are on your way to doing something great. Amen. Ecclesiastes 3.1, everything is beautiful in its time. Wow. Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The fullness of time. Why didn't he send Jesus sooner? People were suffering. They needed a Savior. Why that exact moment? Only God knows, and he's not going to tell us. <laughs> he likes to keep secrets. How many of you love a mystery? You know what? Then you should just really love hanging out with God. <laughs> because there's always a mystery there. It's like, what's going to happen next? <laughs> That's the exciting thing. If you're led by the Spirit, 
you never know what any day is going to hold. Now, if you live under the law, you can have a set of rules, and boy, you're going to do this at 8, and this at 9, and, this, and every morning you read these chapters, and you pray one hour, and you pray by the clock. But I'm telling you what, when you just cut your boat loose from the dock and give yourself to the ocean of God's love, you don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how long I pray every day. I'm so glad I got over counting that. That is so dumb. We just love to impress each other. Oh, I pray two hours every day. Well, good for you. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. Otherwise, you're just bragging and nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> Amen? I don't know how long I pray. I don't know how much of the Bible I read every day. Well, doesn't sound like you're very disciplined. Oh, yes, I am very disciplined. The first thing I do every day is spend a couple hours with God because I am afraid not to. There's no way that I'm going to get out there and act like I'm supposed to if I don't have time with God. When I first started spending time with God in the mornings, my teenagers, at that time they were teenagers, that was a long time ago, they would complain, but do you have to go in that room? Can't you make our breakfast? I said, listen, you're teenagers. You can put cereal in a bowl. You better thank God that I'm going to my room. <laughs> because if I don't, you're not going to like your day nearly as much. How many of you, God needs to send you to your room too? So you, all right. How many of you have gone to and graduated from Wilderness University? Oh, man, been there, done that. Have you noticed how many of God's choice servants spent time in a place called the wilderness <laughs> before they were ever promoted by God? Matter of fact, when God calls you, <laughs> the next place you're going is the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> See, you guys are, you're with it. I don't even have to explain it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> what is the wilderness? It's an isolated place. <laughs> a lonely place. A solitary place. A secluded place. An unpopulated place. You know, I was pretty popular until I decided to go full on with God. And then all of a sudden, I didn't have any friends. Family members didn't want to have a lot to do with us. I mean, here I thought I'd done the right thing, and everybody was going to be excited for me that God had called me to preach. And it didn't turn out to be that way at all. And I felt so lonely. And I would do what I thought God was asking me to do. And then I'd just go on suffering and things didn't get better and then I'd do the next thing I thought he asked me to do and then there was more suffering and I didn't understand. I expected some instant victory and when God called me to preach, I expected to roll out of bed the next day and have this worldwide ministry. Well, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I spent five years teaching 25 people in my living room floor and as Ginger said last night, if you were here, when I started teaching God's Word, I would sit and smoke cigarettes the whole time I was teaching and wear short shorts. And I mean short, as short as I could get them. <laughs> and you say, well, I just don't believe that God would use anybody like that. Well, you're wrong. You know why? <laughs> He anointed a donkey to preach to a prophet who wouldn't listen to him. I didn't know any better. I just didn't know any better. And God, now, that wouldn't work if I was still up to that today. But I'm telling you that God will call you where you are. He will use people that are the, look like the least likely people in the world that God would, it, it, you're not qualified by anything other than God's anointing. But the good thing is, is he sees the end from the beginning. He not only sees where you're at right now, but he sees where you're going to be. He knows your heart. And so this wilderness university thing is designed to change us. 
and to get us acting more like God. Well, Dave told me, get the shorts off. <laughs> so I put on more clothes and I gave up the cigarettes. And 40 some odd years later, I'm still here. So. You might call these years that you spend in the wilderness, wherever that happens to be for you, it may be a job you hate that God won't let you leave. It may be being in relation with somebody that you can barely stand and God keeps telling you to love them anyway. <laughs> Come on, how do you expect to learn how to love the unlovely if everybody around you is lovely? <laughs> Come on. Ooh, God's going to trap you with some nasty people. <laughs> I mean, people that don't treat you right, and he's going to tell you to be kind to them and forgive them every day. Come on now. You're probably going to get a job where you're the only Christian there, and they just treat you so bad. <laughs> You're in wilderness, you. A few years there changes you. How many of you know we need to be changed? Yeah. Joseph graduated from Wilderness University. He had a dream. Looked like God was going to do great things. Next thing that happened to him was he told his dream, and the next thing that happened was his brothers turned on him and sold him to some slave traders. Well, he ended up being the governor, but he spent 13 years in Wilderness University first. Two of those 13 in prison for something he didn't do. But here's what I love about this. He was 17 when he was sold as a slave, 30 when he became governor in Egypt, but God was with him. See, that's it right there. And the patriarchs, Acts 7, 9, the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. It doesn't matter who you lose as long as God is with you. It doesn't matter if you're the only one in your family that's a believer. Bloom where you're planted. Let God use you as an example. Pray for people that mistreat you. Stand firm. As long as God's with you, you're going to end up being successful. Moses, 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years in the wilderness with those 6 million whining Jews? <laughs> you think you want to wring your kids' necks? Try 6 million of them. Forty years. Elijah had his time in the wilderness. David was anointed to be king as a youth, and he became king at age 30. You know what happened the rest of those years? He spent hiding in caves from crazy Saul, who did nothing but try to kill him. And he just kept doing what was right, kept doing what was right, kept doing what was right. Let me ask you something. Can you do what's right while the right thing is not happening to you yet? Come on. Somebody needs to have me say that again. Can you treat people right that are not yet treating you right? Woo, that hurts. Man, that hurts. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you learn in Wilderness University. You learn to obey God, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's comfortable or not. You learn to stay where God tells you to stay, even if you hate the place. When God tells you to go, you learn how to go. You learn that your life is not your own anymore. You use your will to do what God wants. Everything that God says, you only get one answer, yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. 
you know, there's something God's been putting on my heart on and off for a couple years. And I think at first he was just letting me know, you know, time's going to come when I'm going to want you to do this. Well, it's not something I want to do. I just don't want to. It's going to cost money, more than I care to spend. <laughs> and I just don't really want to. But yesterday, I just thought, you know what? I am tired of this. I am going to just do it and get it over with. You know what? When God just keeps annoying you, does God ever just keep annoying you about something? Come on, don't go to sleep on me. You'll get your sandwich in a minute. Does God ever annoy you about anything? In other words, you just keep, it's just like there. Just, it's like an itch you can't scratch. It just won't go. The only way to get your peace back is just say, yes, Lord, go do it. And forget about how much you have to sacrifice or how hard it is. Everything that God asks us to do, he asks us to do it for our good, not his. Come on. Every hard thing that's going on in your life right now, how many of you God is asking you to do some really hard things right now? Come on, let's see. Okay. Let, let me just give you a great piece of wisdom. Are you ready? Just do it and get it over with. I hope you traveled about 400 miles to hear me say that. Just do it and get it over with. And then maybe tonight you can sleep. Even Jesus had silent years. We hear about him when he's born, when he's eight days old, then nothing again until he's 12 years old, and then nothing again until he's 30. And all the Bible says about him during those times was that he grew. <laughs> well, how many of you know what that means? I know what that means. I mean, I was hidden in my basement teaching little home Bible studies, and I grew. I stopped wearing shorts and smoking cigarettes while I taught the Bible. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I had a hard time giving up cigarettes. I smoked, started smoking when I was nine, and... Thank God, I, now, you know, I'll just say this, and you can s throw stones if you want to. <laughs> I don't think smoking's going to keep you out of heaven. We're not, you know, we're not saved because we don't smoke, but it is a nasty habit that's expensive, and it's harmful to your health. And so... It was just something I knew that God wanted me to give up because no matter how you look at it, other, many other people feel that it's wrong and God tells us that, you know, although we have the liberty to do a lot of things, not everything's expedient or the best or the right for us to do. And so God changes us a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. You go through things, and then you get to take a test. And if you don't pass the test, then you get to do that grade over again. <laughs> How many of you are in Wilderness University right now in your life? Isn't this good? See, you're, I mean, you just like, you got it. You know what, what we're doing here. A lot of silent years. Jesus, Luke 4, full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan after he was baptized and was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's a lot of things that we blame on the devil, and there's plenty that he does that we need to blame him for, but sometimes God will lead you into a very uncomfortable place Come on, y'all hearing me up there in the balconies? 
Sometimes God will lead you into a very uncomfortable place because we don't grow when everything is the way we want it to be. We grow when things are not the way we want it to be, and we act like Jesus wants us to act anyway. You know, sometimes God will lead us into and through uncomfortable places in our life, but it's actually good. You know why it's good? Because some of our best times of spiritual growth and maturity come from these places. I always like to say that, that when it hurts and we continue to do what's right, we're growing. When it doesn't hurt, we're enjoying the growth that we already have. The fabric of a culture is stitched together by its people. Here, in parts of rural Southern Africa, some women are treated more like fabric scraps than important parts of society. It's very difficult. You see, if you don't have anything for yourself, people, they don't consider you. The family is saying, I don't have enough money to send you to school. Nobody wanted to marry you. You have to contribute towards this family now. So they clean and they do whatever they can, but they don't bring finances in, so. If you have a skill and knowledge for doing something with your own hands, it can help you. It can help everyone. What man discards, God polishes and shines. Now women here have an opportunity to learn valuable trade skills at the Create Hope Skills Center, and you can get involved to help make this possible for them. We realized if we don't start investing in developing the women, then um, it's really gonna be a limited impact we would have in the community. We then started the skill center. And for a start, we've got the sewing and we've got the leather work happening here right now. Ginger, you can come in. This is our sewing site. Mama Alice. It's nice to meet you. Together with Reaching a Generation, Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, is threading the needle to sew a beautiful new tapestry where women see their value and dream big dreams for their future. And I believe that God, when he looks at you, he sees somebody that he knows very intimately. You're looking at entrepreneurs in training, women learning trades so one day they can own a business and generate their own income. I was happy. I, I just said, ah, thank you, God. You have answered my prayers. I wanted to go somewhere so I can do a short, a short course of sewing. That's my dream. So when I had this opportunity, I have to grab it. Not only are these women learning to build a business, they're also gaining knowledge on how to launch children's churches in their villages. The Create Hope Skills Center is making it possible for women to earn their own money. Otherwise, options are limited. And then you, you, you hit it and then you sew with a hand. They would maybe farm in the fields, and we've had a few years of drought where when our elephants come through, I mean, in this region that we're in right now, there are multiple elephant corridors. So what elephants do for years and years, they actually would follow the same pathway to get through to the river. And then the village would be in the middle of this. And when that happens, is they would have a field, and the next moment elephants come in and they destroy your field, and that's your income for the, you know, for the rest of the year. Everything changes when God opens a new door. You can be the tool he uses to help these ladies prosper by doing what you can to invest in their future. I dream to be a businesswoman, yes, because it allows me to be able to not ask 
from anybody else, yes, to also help other people. I'm this one person who loves working with her hands. So when I heard about leather, that was something very interesting and I was like very happy because I know how to sew, but this I've never in my life seen how they make leather and all. So it was, it was good. How does it make you feel when you look at what your hands have done? Special. <laughs> it makes me feel good and that God loves me so much that with my hands, I was able to make all this. The most vulnerable women in the community are becoming the champions, pouring their love for Jesus into the next generation. We're very excited about the potential of where this thing can go as we start increasing the number of people that can produce in our part of the world. Reaching the next generation requires all of us to work together. It all begins with your prayers and financial support. Because of you, women and girls are transforming as they discover just how precious they are to Jesus and become equipped and empowered in Him. This is my product. <laughs> This one. <laughs>de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner. Fear is everywhere and affects everyone, including me. But with God's help, I've learned how to move forward in the presence of fear and do it afraid. I wrote this book because I want you to experience the peace that Jesus died to give you. In these pages, you'll learn how to understand and confront fear and change your mindset for lasting freedom. If you open your heart to God, He'll help you embrace courage in the face of fear. Ontdek hoe je vooruit kunt gaan in jouw leven en bestel het boek Doe het ondanks je angst van Joyce Meyer. Online via joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Vragen? Bel ons op. Wij zijn er voor je. Telefoonnummer 026 20 22 100.